Hello, my name is Ken. I was diagnosed with central retinal vein occlusion in 2002. I'm not a doctor and I have no medical training, so remember to consult your physician without delay when making medical decisions. If you've watched the introductory video entitled What is Neovascularization, you know that neovascularization occurring on structures at the front of the eye can cause big problems. What you may not have a sense of, though, is how often these vessels typically develop. Are neovascular vessels at the front of the eye common or rare after a central retinal vein occlusion? In this video, we'll look at a study called the Central Vein Occlusion Study. In particular, we'll introduce a portion of the findings with regard to the development of neovascular vessels on the structures at the front of the eye. The central vein occlusion study is widely referenced in medical writings on the subject of central retinal vein occlusion. This study was concluded in the early 1990s and involved more than 700 patients, the majority of whom were followed for more than two years. The study took place before the experimental use of treatments like intravitreal anti-VEGF agents or intravitreal steroids, among others, but included the use of laser procedures. For full description of how lasers were used in preventative as well as treatment procedures during this study, please refer to the original papers listed at the end of this video. A portion of the central vein occlusion study results were broken out by perfusion status. You may recall that the word perfusion has to do with the flow of a fluid through a tissue. Where the blood flows through the vessels of a tissue, that tissue is said to be perfused. Where there is a lack of blood flow, the tissue is said to be non-perfused. In this study, an eye with central retinal vein occlusion was classified as perfused if it had only a smaller total area or even no area where blood was not flowing through the retinal tissue. An eye was classified as non-perfused if it had a larger total area where blood was not flowing through the retinal tissue. You're probably used to hearing the terms ischemic and non-ischemic used as labels for more severe and less severe forms of central retinal vein occlusion. The determination of whether or not an eye is considered ischemic may involve numerous diagnostic factors, but one of the factors that many doctors place heavy emphasis on is the perfusion status of the eye. The central vein occlusion study investigators chose to focus on this particular factor in the distinction of more severe from less severe central retinal vein occlusion. A test called a fluorescein angiogram was administered to each study participant to help determine whether their eye would be classified as perfused or non-perfused. You may recall that this is the test where dye is injected into the arm and a series of pictures are taken of the inside of the eye as the dye flows through the retina. Areas of the retina where the dye was abnormally absent were then measured. If these areas totaled less than 10 of the normal disc areas, the eye was classified as perfused. If these areas totaled 10 or more normal disc areas, then the eye was classified as non-perfused. In some cases, bleeding within the eye made the pictures from the fluorescein angiogram impossible to interpret. In these cases, the bleeding was allowed to subside before a classification was made. Eyes like this were said to be indeterminate until they could be properly classified. The following charts consider only the eyes of patients that were entered into the study within or at one month from the first signs of their occlusion. Of the eyes that were classified as perfused at the beginning of the study, having less than 10 disc areas of non-perfusion, about 13% developed neovascularization of the iris or the angle or both the iris and the angle. So of the 146 eyes which at the beginning of the study had no or only smaller total areas where the blood was not flowing through the retinal capillaries, a relatively small portion went on to develop neovascular vessels at the front of the eye. Of the eyes that were judged to be indeterminate or non-perfused, that is, having 10 or more disc areas of non-perfusion, about 41% developed neovascularization of the iris or the angle, or of both the iris and the angle.
So of the 41 eyes that had substantial areas where blood was not flowing through the retinal capillaries or where bleeding within the eye prevented classification, a large minority of these eyes developed neovascularization at the front of the eye, while a majority remained free of these vessels. The central vein occlusion study also emphasized the predictive value of initial visual acuity, that is, how well the eye saw at the beginning of the study. Of the eyes that had good visual acuity at the beginning of the study, that is 2040 or better, about 7% developed neovascularization on the structures at the front of the eye, the iris, the angle, or both. At the beginning of the study, 70 eyes, without regard to whether they were perfused or non-perfused, all types of eyes, had visual acuity in the good range. The vast majority of these eyes, which had good starting vision, ended the study having had no problems with neovascularization at the front of the eye. Of all the eyes that had intermediate visual acuity at the beginning of the study, that is 2050 to 2200, about 15% developed neovascularization at the front of the eye during the study. So of the group of 72 eyes that started off the study with intermediate visual acuity, including all types of central retinal vein occlusion, a portion had problems with neovascularization at the front of the eye, while a large majority remained free of these problems. Of all the eyes that had poor visual acuity, worse than 2200 at the beginning of the study, about 44% developed neovascularization of the iris or the angle or both during the study. So a substantial portion of the 45 eyes that started with poor visual acuity developed these types of neovascular vessels during the study, while the majority did not. Looking now at neovascular glaucoma, of all the eyes in the study, regardless of when they were entered into the study or whether they were perfused or non-perfused, all eyes, about 16% developed neovascularization at the front of the eye. So now, looking just at that yellow portion, of all the eyes that developed neovascularization at the front of the eye, only 8.5% went on to develop neovascular glaucoma that could not be controlled by the best treatments available at that time. These treatments primarily consisted of panretinal photocoagulation. So the vast majority of these eyes were responsive to the medical treatments. To say this another way, of the entire group of eyes in this study, only 1.4% developed neovascular glaucoma that was unresponsive to the best available treatments at that time. When considering patients who were entered into the study within one month of the first symptoms of their occlusion, of those eyes that developed neovascularization of the iris or the angle or both, about half of those eyes developed the first signs by approximately the two-month mark in the study. But neovascularization may occur substantially beyond this time point. This is why your doctor may advise regular follow-up visits so that any problems with neovascular vessels can be detected early and treated promptly. To sum up then, from a patient's perspective, one highlight of the central vein occlusion study data was that even without the purported benefit of more recently developed treatments, a large majority of patients remained free of neovascular vessels at the front of the eye and when these vessels did arise, a large majority of these patients were responsive to panretinal photocoagulation.